Is that okay? Don't want to see me. Um, oh wait, this? Yes, the window. Sure. All right, perfect. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Martina Kustava. I'm Doctor of Oriental Medicine and Acupuncture Physician and a Nutritionist. Um, I don't recognize any of you from last time, so I'll just tell my story really quick. Um, I'm from Eastern Europe, Bulgaria. I moved here in the United States about 12 years ago. I um, went to school up in Baltimore. I got a degree in finance and nutritional science. Then I moved here and went to school and got a degree in um, Chinese medicine. I'm super fascinated by natural medicine because I grew up with it in Europe. That's all we know. We just I told that that's the medicine all around the world, but I came here and I realized it's not. I actually got really sick when I came to the United States and they put me on antibiotics right away, which I'm, I've never taken any before. Oops. Um, and my body was truly shocked. So I started getting sicker and sicker and just years of being sick all the time. And it was so odd because I, I was never sick growing up. And I couldn't figure out why I was getting sick. So I got into nutrition, studied that, changed my diet, even though I was already eating good. Um, and then when I moved here, and started studying Chinese medicine, I really realized what was happening to my body. Um, so that's my life in a nutshell. Um, I am super fascinated by food. I think food is our main medicine because um, herbs or any kind of pharmaceutical, you take a couple of times a day, but food you eat many times a day. Uh, lunch, breakfast, dinner, uh, or breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. And it's truly like, what well, this is your medicine. So people that come to me and they don't want to change their diet, especially when there's internal medicine issues, um, I always tell them that it's really hard to just fix things with the herbs. It's just not enough. Um, so this lecture today is about food is energy. It will be kind of all over the place, but we'll talk a lot about what energy is to our cells, how we convert it, and how everything becomes really energy in our body. I will not keep it basic because I would kind of assume that some of you know some things about food and so on um stop me at any time ask me any questions ask me to explain and so on um if you want me to give you just some basics while i'm talking i can absolutely do that as well okay so let's go mm, okay all right so the mitochondria so this is our cell that's how most of our cells look like we have many types of cells some of them look different but that's how most of them will look like i think it's super fascinating how beautiful our bodies are and just the cells a simple cell that we have so many in our bodies it's so fascinating there's just so much in it um <clears throat> but in the cell there's the mitochondria which most of you probably have heard it is the um, the energy part of our cell where we convert energy uh, and it's really important part obviously in fact I put a fun fact which I don't know if it's that fun but we have hundred uh, th that many almost like a million if not in some of them will have a million of mitochondria. here are just two but it's actually many many more so it's very important we preserve our mitochondria and we eat food that nourishes our mitochondria because that's how we get energy. I see often people not having enough energy and wanting more energy and going eating foods or taking supplements for more energy. Um, and I'll explain why this is wrong and how we should address that as well. Um, all right, so... So the ATP, so that is actually the molecule that becomes energy in the body. It is found in the mitochondria of all cells. Um, it is obtained from the breakdown of foods, but it's also destroyed by some foods that we eat and many other things. Uh, but that's how the mitochondria, I'm sorry, the ATP looks like this little molecule. Um, and there's many different reactions that has to take place before we get an ATP. Um, and many, many things again destroyed. Okay. So how the mitochondria is affected by external influences? I, I thought that is really important because you can obviously imagine that bad food, junk, and stress and all that will do it. Um, but a lot of people don't think about pollution, and uh, pollution is getting bigger and bigger everywhere. In fact, let me see if I put it in another slide. Never mind. Uh, but pollution will be a big thing. Obviously, stress, and I'll talk more about stress and how to control that with food. Uh, and chemicals in the environment. A lot of people ask me for um, heavy metal tests, which we do, and it's a test with the hair. So we take a 
uh, part of their hair because that's where the heavy metals tend to like stay the longest and uh, is the most accurate test. Um, and just cellular damage can also occur as a natural process. So I just put that in the bottom, just knowing that naturally that happens as well. But most of the time it happens because of the oxidative stress. And that's why antioxidants are so important because they um, prevent that in a way. Okay. So I'm going to address each one of these. I'll talk about the antioxidants, uh, the pollution, the stress, the chemicals in the environment. So first one is foods high in antioxidants, which people talk a lot recently, like, oh, this is high in antioxidants. We should eat foods that are, it is, it, it's only important because they help with that oxidative state in our body and they preserve our mitochondria and do many, many other things. But I'll try not to talk about the other things and talk more about this and be more specific. Uh, so some of those foods, which you probably already recognize, like blueberries, strawberries, pecans, great for your brain, very high in um, fatty acids, which your brain is made of fat. So it's very important we eat a lot of um, healthy fats. In fact, hormones are made of fats. And if we don't have enough good fat in our body, uh, we can make hormones and a lot of things can go, go on. So low fat diet is actually not a good diet, but healthy uh, fat that is the best that that we actually need so um, the whole thing with back in the day when everything became fat free like yogurt fat free this fat free and that fat free we see a lot of alzheimer's dementia um because of that it's a there's a big link research shows that uh, fatty acids healthy fatty acids and mental diseases and degeneration in the brain is related to not enough fats anyway so that's about the pecans <laughs> that's why they report the dark chocolate in fact, very high in magnesium. That's why a lot of women tend to crave dark chocolate in around their period before their period. It's very calming for our nervous system. Um, and again, the dark chocolate, not the one that is full of sugar and so on. Red cabbage, artichokes, beans, spinach, red beets, um, and the rest, I won't read them. Um, I thought also that coffee is a pretty cool one. Um, a lot of people will ask me about coffee, they should, if they should stop drinking coffee. I usually say no, as long as they drink good organic coffee that is not, because most of the time the coffee is very high in pesticides, especially if you buy a coffee that um, is whole beans and you just ground it at home, it's the best thing that you can do. But if you cannot do that and you just buy the, the cheapest coffee, don't drink it. It's full of pesticides. It's so bad for you. And then certain diseases also um, actually respond to coffee. So, uh, but in general, coffee is not bad. In fact, it's very high in antioxidants. And also if you use French press is the best because it preserves the coffee bean oils. So I'll recommend that. It's very cheap. You can get it from Marshalls for like $10. Um, okay, liver, you're gonna keep seeing liver and I'll talk a lot about organ meats, which most of you probably like gross. I don't wanna eat organ meats, they're awful. We eat them a lot in Europe. We tend to be healthy. Um, and I'll explain why they're so important, but there's other ways to also get liver. All right, um, green tea and, um, okay, we talked a little bit more about that, turmeric, and I'll talk about turmeric in a little bit. Okay, so how and what antioxidants support mitochondrial um, health? Um, so I did put, besides obviously the um, antioxidant foods, uh, based on research, alpha lipoic acid and coenzyme CoQ10, which most of you probably know CoQ10 for, um, circulation and heart health and it's often prescribed with or given with um, statins which are the drugs for high cholesterol because they give a lot of muscle aches uh, so a lot of people a lot of doctors that are more into functional medicine will also give CoQ10 uh, it's really protective it's super high in antioxidants very important um, but anyway these two specifically um, help with the mitochondrial health um, and also with the biogenesis. And I put that word and I explain it in the bottom because I, I think it's important. If you ever Google things, it will pop up and it's important for you to know what it is. Uh, and it, it is the increase of mitochondrial cells. So we want to look for foods and things, supplements that can help with that biogenesis. Um, and obviously the more mitochondria we have, the less they're overworked and um, the more energy we gain. The less we have because of damage, of pollution, stress, um, heavy metals, bad diet, the less energy we'll have. So a lot of times it, our low energy goes right down to the cell because we don't have enough mitochondria. And it could be because we live in an area that is very polluted or we have heavy metals in our body. 
Okay, so these two and yes. Well, where would you find alpha acid that's present in Wonderful question. And this is the next slide. You also can get it as a supplement. That'll be the easiest. And I have a little picture there that I just download from Google. Um, they sell it at every health store as a supplement. So you can get that as well. Or since we talk about food, I had to talk about food, but I also want to talk a little bit about supplements because sometimes we don't have time to eat or to cook all the time or just easier to get the supplements. Not to mention that our soil is completely depleted. So our food is not as nutrient dense as it used to be back in the day. So it's also very important to remember that our spinach does not, does not have as much iron as it used to back in the day. Um, so that's why we have to supplement a lot. But anyway, most of these supplements are very affordable. Um, so I'm sorry, and no, I'm, am I on the no, way? No, no, I'm fine. Right here. Okay. I'm no, sorry. No, no, you're good. It's really sticky screenshots. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, okay, so the vegetables like spinach, broccoli, yams, potatoes, um, Brussels sprouts, carrots, blah, blah, all of these that I wrote there, they are, um, they have some uh, lipoic acid, but not as much. The organ meats are the ones they have the most, and those are the hardest to eat for a lot of people. So that's why they have on the picture kidneys, liver, even though they put spinach as having a lot, it really doesn't. It's really the organ meats, uh, which obviously you can just eat it, especially if you um, can go to a farmer's market or connect to a farmer that you can buy organ meats and you know that it's the animals are raised. Because also since the liver, everything goes through the liver, it detoxifies our body. It also holds a lot of toxins. So if you buy a liver that you don't know where it came from, it could be very high in toxins as well and hormones. Uh, but if you find a, good place to buy it um yeah, it's actually it's super like MD market or something. Uh, maybe but i don't know because md market is the asian market right yeah um you really have to figure out where what farm is the meat right. coming from maybe connect with them see if the meat is grass-fed and right. so on and there's mm -hmm. yeah if you can't get the market public does sell a brand that is it's grass-fed and mm. they're considered organic oh cool yeah good to know yeah they also have speaking of publics they have really good bone broth i don't know if you guys are familiar with bone broth it's super nourishing for our bodies but not the one in the box publics has a a bone broth that is in the meat section uh, and it's a in a white bottle and it's actually very gel gelatinized mm -hmm. so anyway it's the, the the real bone broth or you can just make your own but anyway you can ask for both mm -hmm. with regard to that and um, no, no, because Which I make my own stock, so mm -hmm. I but what bone would optimize? Yeah, it is unfortunately. Also, uh, rolling oats, they have ones in jars that they sell, and they have uh, like different ones for people that might not eat uh, beef, but that'll be the one, the, the one, the highest in bone marrow and most nourishing. So, um Okay, yes. When you say yeast, is that just in yeast form or is it could you eat bread that it had yeast in it? <laughs> yes, and with yeast, you have to be careful because uh, if you have candida, for example, if, if your body's more um, tend to get candiditis and like, for example, yeast infections, um, brain fog and things like that, you have to be tested. Uh, but uh, a lot of times the tongue will be like covered in white coat on top, mm -hmm. could be like a little yellowish, but it will have a coat. Um, so then yeast is not that good for you. But nutritional yeast, mm -hmm. since it's very high in so many nutrients, it's great for you. There's kind of controver controversy there as well as mushrooms because they tend to be also in the yeast family. Um, but in general, they say that shouldn't be a good idea. But again, it's kind of, the, the research is not very conclusive on that because I've looked into it. And But anyway, yeah, uh, especially nutritional yeast, I would say that mm -hmm. would be the best choice. All right, so that will be those will be the food with um, alpha lipoic acid, or you can just again get the supplement. Uh, will be easier, not as absorbable because all, the organic form is always always better. Just like, um, for example, if you have you guys heard about liposomal uh, vitamins? No. Okay, so uh, like they they also kind of became big in the last couple of years. Liposomal vitamin C, for example. Um, so they called they bind the vitamin to um, a lipid group, lipid molecular group. So it's more absorbable to the body because the cell of the wall, it's covered in lipids. It's very hard to penetrate. Nothing can penetrate unless it's like in a lipid form. 
So when they do that, it tends to be more uh, permissible to the cell. So, um, so they started to combine different things. So things are more absorbable to us uh, as far as supplements and vitamins. However, the organic natural form will always be best because our bodies will recognize it better than anything else. So just like if you squeeze two lemons and add some honey water and you drink that, it has, even though it has less vitamin C than actually getting like vitamin C supplement, it's more absorbable and bioavailable for your body. So you react better to it, even though on paper it will have less vitamin C. Oh, one more question. Yes. Is it um is it best to eat it like raw or cooked or how do you get the most nutrients out of it? Of the the vegetables. Mm -hmm. Uh so I'll talk about that a little bit at the okay. end with the Chinese medicine and so on. So uh, for example, kale, you should never eat it. Um, I always talk about kale because it actually attacks our thyroid, so you should never eat it raw. It should always be cooked. Certain things you can eat raw, but also we have to see wh where your digestion is. If you ha if you don't have enough hydrochloric acid, if you have digestive issues, raw foods are actually really bad mm -hmm. for you. So cooked is better like steam. Okay. Um, and as long as it's not, not completely cooked, you'll still get the nutrients. So, yes. So kale salad is not as healthy as I led myself to believe. Yes. So kale has a, an enzyme in it that attacks the, the thyroid unless it's cooked. Yes, I know. And everything in moderation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'm a gardener. Mm -hmm. And most anything, and I have thyroid in mm -hmm. the particular family. Yes. Um, Broccoli. Broccoli. Yeah. But, and I have, I, I mm -hmm. So, and again, everything in moderation, you can always have a little bit of things, but when you have a whole uh, kale salt, meaning like all the greens are kale and then tomatoes and whatever, then it's a problem. If you have arugula, you have celery, um, um, not celery, lettuce, a little bit of kale might not be an issue, but if it's a whole thing or you juice kale, like I used to and destroyed my thyroid, they don't even know that at the time mm -hmm. but yeah that's pretty bad all right one, one last question yes um so like let's say i found some great liver mm -hmm. or kidney or something mm -hmm. is it the flesh or if i boiled it or if i ate it raw what would what be the best method to get the lipid acid out of an yeah. organ Right. So it will be cooked, even though there is another big trend recently, people eating, especially on the internet, eating raw meat and telling them raw meat is better because that's it, we digest it better and so on. It's really not the case because it's very high in parasites and all kinds of things that we cannot kill anymore because our hydrochloric acid is very low due to stress, bad diet and due, due to aging as well. So a lot of us, if not all of us, have low hydrochloric acid without even knowing. And th that acid is the acid in our stomach. It's so uh, acidic that it uh, not only kills bacteria, parasites, viruses that is on our food all the time, it helps with digestion, absorption of B12 because of the intrinsic factor that it releases. But it also, um, if you swallow a piece of glass, it will dissolve it as well. But we don't have enough, unfortunately, because again, stress, bad diet, um, aging lowers it. So without really realizing you don't have enough and eating raw meat uh, that is already high in parasites and who knows what else, uh, will, you'll be very hard time fighting that in your stomach. Cooked will be better and you can look up uh, different recipes. You can have it boil, you can boil it and it, uh, then you can um, like um, saute it with some onions, it tastes really good. But there's so many different recipes. You can make it into a spread and put it on a toast, it's really good. But liver is like, really the best meat you could eat, super high in every nutrient you can ever imagine, very high in A, E, D, vitamins, um, very good for people that are anemic, uh, people with liver issues. There is actually a supplement, sorry, I can talk about this forever, yeah. but really quick so we can move on. There is a supplement by um, Ancestros, it's the company, they're kind of expensive, but they have, um, their beef is in New Zealand, it's grass-fed, very clean of and it, of, of all pesticides, hormones, and antibiotics that unfortunately we give here to our um, cattle. Uh, they have really good supplements for the thyroid. They have, and they actually, it is a thyroid in a capsule, liver in a capsule, which is really good for people with anemia or people with uh, fatty liver, um, cirrhosis, um, and just liver issues. Uh, they have, um, and I think it's called blood something or just blood. 
but it has liver and spleen in it. They have uh, one that is hard, that they have lard. So it's, it is priced, it's $50 um, bottle. Uh, ancestrals, yes. Um, so that's a way to get it, just with a supplement like that. So some of my patients that would not eat liver, I just tell them to take the supplement. But if you could, again, there's so many recipes. And once you get used to it, it's actually pretty delicious. Um, uh, beef will be better, but if you find whatever you find, chicken, beef, you can do both. So, um, all right. So, then we're going to foods high in CoQ10. CoQ10 is most of the time taken as a supplement, um, but oily fish, um, again, organ meats, um, and the whole grains. Um, and unfortunately, the whole grains will be kind of like lower. A uh, pasture raised meat, um, wild caught fish, you want to always eat wild caught just because the farm race, it's really bad, high in all kinds of things, has no nutrients in it, and it can only cause harm. Um, in fact, uh, Costco has really good salmon that is wild caught. It's really good price. It's like six or seven pieces for $14. They're already seasoned, but it's wild caught. You do need a lot of um, omega-3 because they are antioxidants as well. Um, and you can get them as a supplement or just eat the fish. Anyone you know, there was a yes, request sorry. when people yeah. ask questions, if you can repeat it, is that people at home can't hear what's being asked. Oh, sorry. Okay, no, I will. Fine. No yes. Um, okay. And uh, again, like healthy fats coming up with avocados, coconut oil, olive, olive oil, um, nuts. Okay. So pollution. I don't know if you guys heard about PM 2.5. It's a pollutant. I guess that's the word but um it's actually very high almost everywhere you can go to airnow.gov and look at your area where you live and the pollution at the time of the day um it's not i didn't find any information about saint petersburg somehow i don't know why but <laughs> tampa was at one point moderate which is still like there's pollution there um and but you can keep checking it throughout the day and just know what it is what it is what's going on um we do inhale it all the time. It's obviously super toxic for our bodies. Uh, one of the things that um, can lower that is glutathione, which um, in the clinic we have it as an injectable, but you can buy it also as a supplement. Uh, superoxide dis dismutase, uh, it's another one also sold as a supplement. Um, I just um, highlighted those just so you know them and if you've heard them before. Um, about other things that help as far as that, because this class is about that and food, would be omega-3, foods high in omega-3, which we already talked about, um, nuts and um, especially flax seeds too. But um, for the vegans or the vegetarians, you can also get, uh, there is a udo, I think it's udo, it's a, it's a nut oil in a bottle that is high in omega-3. Um, but if not, fermented cod liver oil is the best. Uh, fermented, it's better because it tends to be more bioavailable for our bodies. It's also very high in um, vitamin A and D. Vitamin D is not a vitamin, it's actually a hormone, but anyway. But you can just take that supplement and it's stop taking the vitamin D that you're taking. Just one supplement will take care of that. But it's more of a bioavailable fermented cod liver oil for the omega-3. Food high in vitamin C, E, um, B vitamins, very important. You don't want to take just the B12. I have patients that come and just want B12 injections. I explain them why it's not good enough. They still want it. I give it to them. Um, but B complex is better because B vitamins, they're cofactors of one another. So they help one another. Um, activated form, which is the methylcobalamin for the B12, is better than cyanocobalamin. It's not as absorbable. So when you buy B vitamins, make sure you look at the B12 form that is called methylcobalamin uh, and not cyano. It's not as absorbable as a cheaper form. Yes. Is it written there? Or no, I'm just... The cobalamin, uh, let me see if I find Thank the... You. Yeah. Sorry, I just go on like rant about things. Uh, I'll write it here. It's a good lamp. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> I don't think there's spelling mistakes, but maybe. So for, forgive me if there are some. But this is the form you want to look for B12. Um, the cyanocobalamin, which is in a lot of um, in a lot of supplements, uh, it's the cheaper one and is not as absorbable. Also, if you have um, 
mutate mutated gene which some people have um it's called the mt fh i think mt fh gene mt fhr mt hfr <laughs> um you cannot have cyanocobalamin it's going to make you very sick so moving on according to study in delhi india which they have so much pollution ginger honey lemon tea um it helps a lot with the just expanding the pollution turmeric and licorice tea uh, also, just sweating it out, going to infrared sa saunas, um, it's another good thing to get rid of that. But it's good to know you can always check the area that you live or if you're going to move, uh, if there's pollution and so on. But we unfortunately have to think about that too. And that pollution destroys our mitochondria as well and causes all kinds of issues. All right. So stress in the mitochondria. Um, okay, let me see. Okay, sorry, just wanted to see if someone has a question. Okay, so I put that there. Who says we can control stress? Like I used to hate when people say like, oh, just stop stressing. And I'll be like, okay, like never thought about that. Thank you for telling me. And I never say that to patients when they say like, oh, I'm going through so much, I'm stressed. I'm never like, oh, just stop stressing. Stress is bad for you. Duh, it is like they already know. It's super annoying. So we talk about how to control stress with different things. Um, and sometimes they can't do everything. Sometimes they can just adjust their diet. Sometimes they don't want herbs. Uh, there's all kinds of things that you can do or not do. But even one, even if you do one thing, that can help so much with stress. Stress destroys our life. In Chinese medicine, we say that stress um, consumes qi and blood. And um, we need qi and blood to survive, to live and all that. Uh, in Western medicine, and I'm talking mostly about Western medicine now, but eventually I'll like transition to Chinese medicine because that's my specialty, even though I studied that for four years. But anyway, um, so I'll talk about, um, I, I love that part and I'll just read it to you. When we encounter a perceived threat, such as large dog barking at us, our hypothalamus sets off an alarm in our body through a combination of, of nerve and hormonal signals, which means our sympathetic nervous system gets turned on. That, that's the system of fight or flight and it only gets um turned on if something like that is happening a large dog is barking at us someone is chasing us down the street at night uh and then our adrenal glands those are the glands right on top of our kidneys uh they release adrenaline and cortisol they do that as um as a way for us to survive so if we are attacked by a large dog or someone is chasing us at night we need to be able to run faster than usual we need to be able to um preserve ourselves or fight with that person, whatever it is. So adrenaline gives us all this power and it makes us do that. Um, so the adrenaline, as you see, increases our heart rate, elevates our blood pressure, boosts energy supplies. Um, and um, cortisol, on the other hand, it increases the sugar in the bloodstream. Um, let me see what else is important. Okay, I talked to you about fight or flight. Um, it suppresses the digestive system and reproductive system. And this is really cortisol doing that by uh, turning on the sympathetic nervous system. And when that happens, everything kind of shuts down. We can activate that by just worrying or being stressed without nobody chasing us. Nothing like that is happening. But because we're thinking about things, life, bills, whatever, uh, we turn on that system and we start uh, releasing adrenaline and cortisol. So our blood sugar goes up, our blood pressure goes up. And eventually, because we're not made to live with that system turned on the whole time, we start getting sick. Our body cannot just keep on with that. Um, so cortisol, it's a big one and we want to lower the cortisol. But again, don't stress out, doesn't work. So what can we do about that? Um, okay, let's see. So cortisol, um, there's supplements, but again, like we talk more about uh, foods and things like that. When cortisol is increased in the body over a special long period of time, we start developing diseases like anxiety, depression, digestive problems, headaches, muscle tension and pain, heart disease, heart attack, high blood pressure and stroke, sleep problems, weight gain, um, and memory and concentration impairment. So I see patients that come for one of those um, and they want me to treat them for their digestive problems, but their digestive problems are caused by high cortisol and the high cortisol is caused by their stress. Um, 
So if I just give them herbs or treat them for their digestive issues, won't really do anything because I'll be just treating the symptoms because they will constantly still, their bodies will fight with the herbs that I'm giving them. Um, so you always have to think and go deeper than, oh, I just have digestive issues or I have anxiety. Most of the time, anxiety is actually related to irregulation um, of the blood sugar in the body, like uh, hypoglycemia. People don't regulate their blood sugar properly and their pancreas stops regulating the, regulating it the proper way. So instead of having their blood sugar just going up and down, up and down throughout the day like that, it actually goes up and down, up and down because we only have one meal or two meals because we didn't have time because I don't like breakfast and I just ate really fast. And that's very bad for our nervous system. So a lot of people when they, especially women, when they uh, have more balanced blood sugar, they tend to not have anxiety anymore. Um, okay, going back to cortisol. <laughs> okay, so foods that lower cortisol. Um, once again, foods high in omega-3. Anchovies, avocado, chia seeds, flax seeds, herring, uh, mackerel, olive oil, oysters, salmon, sardines, tuna, walnuts. Um, those have research shows that those foods um, that are high in omega-3 tend to like lower cortisol. So we can control our stress by the way we eat. If we cannot control it with our psych, um, then we can control it at least with the way we eat. And I know it's difficult because when we're stressed, we want to eat bad, we don't want to eat good, uh, but you can still eat kind of bad with those good foods. Um, and at least kind of having nuts as snack throughout the day, but this will help a lot. Also foods high in magnesium. Magnesium is very calming for our nervous system. Uh, we're all deficient in it because again, our soil is completely depleted. Um, so we should take magnesium. There's different forms. Uh, the magnesium oxide is really the worst. Um, so any supplement that you get and you see magnesium oxide, you should not take. It's only good for um, constipation. And if you don't have one, you're gonna get loose stools or diarrhea. I have a, I had a patient that she is 75, she's very healthy, no pain in her body, nothing. And, but she has been having diarrhea for the last couple of years. And I couldn't figure out why. When she bought her supplements and I looked through them, I saw that lots of them had magnesium oxide, just small milligrams, but they still had it. I told her to stop all of them. The very next day, she didn't have diarrhea anymore. It just, wow. it was fixed that way. But it's cheap form. So a lot of supplement companies will actually include it, uh, magnesium oxide. You want to look at the glycinate, which is the one actually for the brain. Um, that's will be one of the best but there's different ones that are more specific but glycinate is pretty good there is a brand called uh, magnesium calm yes can you spell out the good one uh yes Thank you. i'll put x here oh. <laughs> where's my phone i need google <laughs> glycinate maybe mm -hmm. Just write magnesium gly, it will come up. So glycinate is better for um but like for, brain health. Yes. What is better for like muscle relaxation? Uh the brand calm I like a lot and it's uh it's magnesium. Calm. Yes, calm. it's yeah. so good and it's good for your muscles. Uh you have to be careful with that one because it, it since it relaxes the muscles, it relaxes yeah. the large I've, intestine. I've taken that one. Okay, yeah. So just be careful with the dose because just play with it to see right. where it does not uh, cause loose tools. But I think it's magnesium ca carbonate, well, the one on the yeah. yeah. So on theirs. All right. So yeah. So avocados, bananas, broccoli, uh, dark chocolate, pumpkin seeds, spinach. These are also antioxidants. Uh, so they, a lot of them will repeat. Um, and you don't have to incorporate all of them all the time, but just adding little things here and there can make a big, big difference. Um, but these are very high in magnesium and they can help a lot with just calming you down and helping with the cortisol release. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll talk about the telomere. I don't know if you guys ever heard about this. Uh, the telomeres, they're the endings of, um, and it's a protective cast casing, casing at the end of the strand of our DNA. So it's the very end of our DNA. Uh, they have been researched uh, a lot in the last couple of years. There was a man that I forgot his name. He actually uh, won a Nobel Prize because he related the telomeres to aging, um, fast aging and cancer. 
and they are shortening every time our DNA multiplies. Um, and the more they shorten, eventually um, we die when they are completely short. Uh, there is a way they, they can be shortened faster or we can um, increase their, their length in a way, by the way, what we, with the way we eat, uh, stress level and things like that. Um, so let me see. So yeah, telomerase, um, anything that actually uh, ends in ACE, it's an uh, enzyme, just so you know. Um, that, and it's actually high in certain foods, uh, but I'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, that can help a lot with just replenishing it. Um, if we talk about all the way down to, a, to our DNA. Um, cortisol exposure, once again, decreases that supply. So stress again will decrease that supply. Um, and I said that. So when it, the telomere gets too short, it will eventually die and we die with it. So telomere protective diet. Um, so interestingly enough, foods that are purple, blue, are very in those rich uh, colors. Um, in Chinese medicine, uh, kidneys are actually the where our essence is. Um, and the kidneys like those color, those foods that are in those colors. So I found that kind of interesting. But um, so again, cacao powder, so dark chocolate, coffee, olives, flax seeds. So these keep repeating. So pay attention to them and make sure you get some in your house and have them regularly. Um, so deep red, purple, and blue pigmented foods, legumes, nuts, seaweed, fruits, 100% fruit juices. Um, and the shortening of the telomere is associated with alcohol, red meat, and processed meat, which at the end, I'll talk about all these different um, theories, put it that way, that actually contradict one another. I'm telling you eat red meat or eat... Um, mm -hmm organ meats, um, and now I'm telling you, oh, don't eat that because you should eat more of that because it will help with um, telomeres. Again, everything in moderation and everything can be helpful or very harmful to you. Uh, but that's the telomere. Um, and again, they've been researched more and more. So I think more information will start coming up about them and how to, again, have more of a protective diet and take care of those telomeres so we can live longer, have a a better lifestyle and not die from cancer. Um, but anyway, he won a Nobel Prize for that because he saw very close relationship with, between the telomeres and uh, aging and cancer. Okay, so now as a Chinese medicine practitioner, I have to talk about Chinese medicine and how that relates to foods. All of the rest was more of a Western medicine, uh, which do you guys have any questions? Yes. Which would you um, suggest to start back the last one? Yes. Like seaweed with steak. Is mm -hmm. there, do you recommend a particular kind of steak? Uh, Anyone? I wouldn't, I mean, okay. they're all pretty good as long as, uh, like, Costco has a good brand and it's organic um, and uh, it's a lot. Like, they have a, a, a big case that is like really on a good price. So, I'll recommend that one because it's organic and it's not that expensive because most of them tend to be very expensive. Um, the kelp is good to any really seaweed, but it's kind of hard now with the ocean because the ocean is very polluted now too, so you don't know where to get it. But, and given that you personally have thyroid symptoms, mm -hmm. thyroid disorder, um, seaweed is bad. Yes. Okay. To, no, you can eat it raw too. But how would it be iodine? How would yeah. it right, affect your medication and, for thyroid? So it depends what medication you're on, but it's actually really good for your thyroid. I, I recommend yeah, yeah, yeah. very much seaweed because of that, and it's so much more bioavailable. Um, and you you can just eat it raw or like the the chips that they sell, you can like, because it's like already kind of cooked, the crisp, um, you can do that. And I have a patient that she never went on medication and she just ate a lot of seaweed and her thyroid was regulated by that. Recently, I also heard iodine and selenium. Yes, selenium is a big one. I always tell my patients with thyroid, selenium, and I, and um, seaweed. Selenium is a big one, and you you can take a lot of it too. And take the capsulated one, not because they and it's not expensive either. Uh, you can buy it even from Amazon, but get the one that it's capsulated and not the tablets because they have a lot of binders. So I want just the capsulated one. So that's a good one. Yeah. Also, macadamia nuts, Brazil nuts, they're very high in um, selenium. You can have that as a snack. 
Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Anybody else? No. Okay. So, Buddhist energy from Chinese perspective. Um, so that's a big one that I hear a lot. Like, I'm always tired. I need more energy. I'm fatigued most of the day. I don't have much appetite. Um, so the first three will be, will be the ones that I hear the most. And quite often also the, I don't have much appetite. I can't wake up without coffee. I just cannot wake up in the morning. I'm always tired. I'm fatigued. I have brain fog. Um, and I'm easily depressed. So these are very common. I see them almost all the time. And they actually mean one syndrome in Chinese medicine, which we call spleen chi deficiency. So in Chinese medicine, the spleen is the one that makes chi and blood. Um, it's responsible for holding the blood in the body, in the vessels. Um, it's responsible for holding organs. So prolapse, um, it's because of spleen chi deficiency or long-term spleen chi deficiency, unless it was a trauma. Um, but um, if, a lot of times people won't have enough blood as well if they don't have if they're spleen chi deficient eventually they become spleen blood deficient and these symptoms are all of the symptoms that i see um we treat that with herbs and um with changing their diet um but those will be the loose tools worrying overthinking pale complexion very low energy lots of times it could start with just someone that worries a lot and overthinks everything a lot and they damage their spleen that way uh, or it could be people that already damage their spleen with bad diet because the spleen does not like that. There is high in sugar and fatty foods um, and they become worried and overthink everything. So those will be the people they say like, I've never been this way. I don't know why. Now I think I overthink everything. I worry all the time. Um, so those will be the people that with diet, they could have, they damage their spleen. Uh, sometimes people are like, I've always been that way. I'm just a warrior. I worry all the time they damage their spleen with the way they think. Uh, once that happens, I start seeing fatigue, lack of appetite, loose tooth, um, uh, very, very low energy. Uh, but these are some of the symptoms. I kind of like the picture, so I put it there. Um, so yeah, governs digestion of nutrients into energy. So a lot of times people with digestive issues, I would see that spleen chi deficiency as we call it. So we have like good herbal formulas for that. Um, but again, that is more important than the herbs for sure. Um, you can't just give herbs and if the patient doesn't change their diet, it won't help much. Uh, if the patient changes the diet, it might take a little longer, but they can get back into balance. Um, so here is just another slide I found uh, and I put it in with some of the healing foods. So the spleen likes cooked foods. The spleen does not like anything raw. So a lot of a lot of vegans, vegetarians, raw eaters, after a while, they tend to have a lot of digestive issues. And they say like, I eat so healthy, I'm a vegan, I'm a vegetarian, everything is raw. And I don't know, but I have all these digestive issues. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and that actually happened to me. And I could not figure out why, because I was super healthy, yet I had all these issues. Turns out I destroyed my spleen with that cold diet, because those foods tend to be very cold in their nature. Not meaning cold like taking it out of the refrigerator, but they're very cooling for the body. Therefore, if you think about it, that's why we should eat seasonal because in uh, we cannot eat foods that are not in season, even though we can find them in Publix because they're not really good for us. That's why in the summer, you kind of crave watermelon and fruits and vegetables and smoothies because you're hot. You need to like cool down. In the winter, you tend more fatty foods, heavier foods because your body needs more warmth. Um, and it's important to look into seasonal diet and just eat seasonal. It's best for your body. Your body craves that. Um, so the foods that are good, but even if someone in the summer it's hot and they have damaged spleen, I still won't recommend cold foods like smoothies and salads. I'll recommend cooked foods. Um, and uh, yellow foods tend to be, be, the spleen likes it because it's also a part of the earth element. And that's the color of the earth element. Um, avoid oops, avoid uh, cold foods and a lot of raw foods. Uh, that's very, very important to preserve the spleen. And once the spleen gets back to just working normally, people will have more energy. Yeah. So best spleen chi tonics, con chi, that's a big one. Uh, you can find a bunch of recipes online. It's a Chinese, the Chinese eat it all the time, if not every day. Uh, it's just part of their diet, um, just like a cereal, I guess, is part of ours. 
uh, but it's almost overcooked rice uh, and you can use barley, rice, millet, um, oatmeal um, and cook it to the consistency of a porridge um, and you can make it salty with meat, eggs and whatever they had there. Um, or you can make it sweet by putting goji berries. Um, they're very nourishing, very good for your blood, for your for energy. They're antioxidants as well. Um, you can put a little bit of honey and you can eat that throughout the day. It's breakfast or lunch or dinner or snack. But that's very easy for the spleen to digest and it's, it's just, it will feel good in, in your tummy. Um, sweet potatoes, amazing, big cheat tonics, soups, all kinds of soups as long as they're not cream-based are very good. This is also a good diet for someone that was just sick or is sick or is um, very just depleted and tired and went through like a long disease. Um, it's very good for them. They should not have salads and uh, raw vegetables and smoothies and all that. It will should deplete them even more. Um, those people should stay away from cold drinks as well. Um, a lot of fatty foods, even if that's avocado or coconut oil, if your spleen does not digest food properly, um, it will create, we call it dampness or that mucus in the body, which I think the next slide is about that. Do you, yeah. How long would you have to, um, eat like these things to feel the, the difference of chi coming back? Um, it depends really how far the spleen chi deficiency is because there's almost levels. Like we can have spleen chi deficiency, then we have spleen blood deficiency, then we, we can have um, spleen, chi, spleen chi sinking where we have a whole prolapse. So we see, see it more on physical level and it could be very mild. Um, for example, someone that kind of overworked was going through something stressful last month and now they're just very fatigued and tired. So they start eating like that and in a couple of days, a week or two, they're back to normal. With some herbs, especially, it will be very easy. Someone that has long-term spleen chi deficiency, it will take a little longer. It might not take forever, but it will take a little longer. So uh, it really depends where they are and what their constitution is. In Chinese medicine, we talk a lot about constitution. If you are born a certain way, um, so some people are like have a stronger immune system. It's almost like constitution, I would say, is the immune system. But some people, like for example, my brother, he has so much energy. He's super energized. Um, I don't, and I'm always sick and all that. So we have to see where their constitution is. So it, it really depends. If you incorporate herbs, that will help a lot too. Um, so these two in, together uh, can work better than just changing the diet. It will just be faster, I would say. But again, it will, it really depends. But usually people feel good like in a day or two because wow. their digestion just feels better. Like I had a patient that I actually saw today. She She's really young and she's vegan. She doesn't want to eat anything animal. She just feels bad for the animals. Um, but she has lots of issues because of that, especially digestive issues. And um, she started eating more soups, more cooked foods, and the digestion went, like all the problems went away. Mm -hmm. There's still some things there because she's very deficient because she doesn't eat meat and doesn't take any supplements for that. Um, but the digestion like fixed itself pretty much almost right away. But she's also really young. So oh, yeah. Okay, so um, fatty foods, sugar, which all know sugar is so bad for us. Cancer is sugar. We want to always stay away from sugar, but it's so hard because it's so addictive. It's in everything, but it's really such a bad thing for us. Okay, so dampness. Um, dampness is what I was talking about with the spleen. Qi deficiency eventually creates dampness. So spleen in Chinese medicine uh, transports and transforms the liquids in our body. Uh, and the spleen and stomach work together. So that's really our digestion in Western medicine. It's very important because as we call it now, and I had a lecture about that, about um, mental uh, health and digestion, uh, the enteric nervous system is called, this is the nervous system in our stomach. It's, we call it the second brain. Now everyone is all about probiotics and taking care of our gut and everything. It's so important for mental health, for this, for that, for the other side. So everyone is paying attention to their gut and they want everything to correct whatever is happening there. Um, so that will be in a way kind of equivalent to the spleen and stomach in Chinese medicine or kind of close, I guess. Uh, but anyhow, so the spleen tends to do that job. So it's, it regulates uh, digestion, absorption, and so on. 
if we don't have enough spleen chi, and if you're more exhausted, if we eat a lot of cold foods, we deplete the spleen. So the spleen becomes very sluggish. It cannot do that job anymore. So it starts creating dampness. And dampness is that, um, the dampness in the next level will be phlegm. Uh, but it's not heaviness and it's not really in the physical level, but it's more like people will say, I feel very sluggish. I feel tired all the time. I have brain fog. I'm just, I want to lay on the couch. I have no desire to do anything. They just have that sluggishness inside of them about them. They just feel that way. They feel like heavy. They might have a headache that it feels like, um, like a bent around their head, like a heavy towel put on their head. Uh, they might get their symptoms might get worse before it rains or after it rains when it's more humid outside. So that shows a lot of dampness in their body. Their tongue is always covered in white coat or yellow coat, but it has a, this thick, like almost like cottage cheese coat. Uh, we check the pulse in Chinese medicine, so we call this the pulse being very slippery. Um, so, but that in Western medicine, translated in Western medicine, will be like sluggish digestion, hard time waking up in the morning, foggy thinking, water retention. Um, and that would be the next level again after the spleen chi deficiency. So we see that dampness um, and it, it could start with spleen chi deficiency, bad diet, um, earth constitution, as I said, uh, someone that was born with that. We all have different constitutions. We all have different tendencies for different diseases. Some people have, um, they gain weight easily. Some people um, have headaches since they could remember themselves. So some people uh, have a, a lot of emotional issues. They just can't control their emotions. So we're all like, have different tendencies and in Chinese medicine because of the five elements we'll put them in like we'll say oh this is earth constitution and they can have you know two or three two but primarily will be the earth one uh, but that will be a constitution or someone born to create more damp um, war and overthinking weakens the spleen and creates more damp so when people worry a lot they overthink and again those, those are normal emotions uh, all emotions are normal as long as we feel them for certain period of time is not all the time but it, when they become in our life for longer than they are supposed they create diseases and in chinese medicine there are seven diseases that create uh seven i'm sorry emotions that create disease over a long period of time okay let's see uh okay so food is yes sorry yeah i'm sorry when you said you check the pulse mm -hmm. what are you checking for the rapidity or slowness or other Okay, so the question was, now I remember to repeat the question. No, the question is about uh, what we check with the pulse. So in Chinese medicine, that's a, because it's such an old medicine, it's over 2000 years medicine. So they did, not have, they did not have labs and microscopes and they have very different understanding of diseases. They have their own words and they didn't have stethoscopes, for example. So their way of diagnosing was looking at the tongue, which tends to be very accurate. And some Western medicine doctors do the same thing to a certain extent. Um, uh, we check the pulse, so each, there's like six positions on both sides, or three on the left, three on the right. In each position, it's an organ under it, in a way. So we look for the, for the speed, for example, where, where the pulse is, if it's like very superficial, if it's in the middle position, if it's all the way to the bone, that tells us something. If the pulse is fast, is if the pulse is very slow, if it's hard to find the pulse, if the pulse is overflowing, if the pulse is like a string hitting my hand or my fingers when I put them, if it feels very, as we call it, slippery, um, the Chinese call it as if you touch pearls on a plate, like it just moves like that. So there's different things that we look for uh, and all these different things tells us something. For example, if someone comes in and they're very energetic, they talk a lot, they, they just they have all this energy. I check their pulse and I could barely find it. I see they're very deficient, even though they look very like excess. Or someone that comes in, they're just very quiet and like shallow, shallow, very quiet and shy, barely talk. They just look very tired. And I check their pulse and it's very fast, very just overflowing. That shows me some excess in their body. So that changes the whole treatment. Uh, so that would be how the Chinese um, use the pulse. Uh, pulse on I know, yeah, they have all these explanations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the whole Chinese medicine, in fact, it's very poetic and yeah. it was created based on the seasons and their nutrition or their food therapies based on the seasons. And if you think about it, not really anymore, but Chinese back in the day, they were the nation that lived the, mo the longest and had the best quality of life. Not only the longest, but the best quality before even medicine, as we know it as Western medicine, was so developed. Um, so Chinese were lived very long and they have very good quality of life. Uh, so there's much we can learn from 
that time back in the day. Um, you have a question online yes. um, from a TCM perspective. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about people with resections or removals of like, let's say their gallbladder, um, mm -hmm. how, um, just trying to paraphrase, mm -hmm. how that would affect your chi and how can you effectively do it? So. Yes, so we treat based on the Chinese meridians, uh, which they're right here. So we treat based, or we put the, the needles based on the Chinese meridians. So they run from the head to the toes, or the toes to the head, the hand, like there's 12 main meridians of 12 main organs. And um, so even though the organ was removed, the meridian is still there. So energetically, it's still there. And the meridians in Western medicine now, they explain it with the fascia. I don't know if you guys have heard about the fascia, my fascia release, the massage therapist talk so much about it. So it's actually, it's a physical thing and uh, you can see research about it, but it's this thin layer, thin sheet that covers all of our organs, all of our bones and uh, our muscles. It's also covered with nerves and it's so sensitive, it's sensitive as if I touch my skin. So by putting the needle and touching that sheet, it has a reaction to the body. Um, when we get stressed, that sheet gets very tight and uh, it's almost like can squeeze an organ. So that's why when you're stressed, you just feel that tightness. People say, I have tightness in my chest or in my stomach or in my head or whatever it is. Um, so that's how we treat it. So even though the meridian was, uh, I'm sorry, the organ was removed, the meridian is still there. So we can still affect it with herbs or with uh, uh, acupuncture points. Um, and there's just a lot that um, we still don't know about the human body from Western point. Uh, but the Chinese somehow figure out lots of it that now becomes more of a, oh, that was proven by research. Uh, but yeah, people still can get treated for spleen tree deficiency. If they, if they have um, their spl spleen removed, they can still have gallbladder dam heat, another diagnosis, even though they don't have gallbladder. Um, for example, th there is a, I'm not going to go, sorry, <laughs> too deep into it because I have to go through different diagnoses and it's just too much to explain, but yes, um, in a nutshell, we can still treat it because energetically their meridian is still there. So, and in fact, have you guys heard about, um, what is it called? The Curtian Kurt um, photography? Oh, look at a photo. What is it? Arterium. Yes, yeah. that one. So a photography that they show that when the person took pictures, they still saw a woman that had uh, her arm amputated on the picture, you can still see mm -hmm. kind of like vague, but still the energy of it there. Um, so there's still something there we just don't say we don't understand. And just like many, many things um, we don't understand, but it's still mm -hmm. there. Even like a leaf with part of it that was cut off, you can still see it in the picture. So energetically somehow it's still there. So mm -hmm. that's why we can affect things um, mm -hmm. from our limited understanding and research so far. All right. So. Um, Again, people come and they want more energy or they want foods that will give them more energy or eat salad, they're going to give you more energy or do this or do that. But what about depression? So depression is so big and often uh, manifests as low energy and it's like hidden. It's kind of hard sometimes to find because either people don't want to accept that they are depressed or um, they don't realize it because they just have all these symptoms, but they don't feel depressed. But low energy often, uh, depression often expresses itself as low energy. Um, depressed people, unfortunately, tend to eat unhealthy foods. Um, and that's what makes it even worse because they, it's more difficult for the enteric nervous system. In fact, we shouldn't, especially when our cortisol is high, when we're stressed, we shouldn't eat. When we're stressed, we should not eat. And we do it. We actually like go and eat a lot. We eat bad food. Uh, but our digestion shuts down because our cortisol is so high that um, it's very hard for us to digest food. And that's why we get constipation, diarrhea, all kinds of digestive issues. Um, but we don't listen to our bodies and we just do whatever and it, it, things get worse. But anyhow, going back to depression, I think it's important to always ask yourself um, if you don't have enough energy, if you're looking for things to give you more energy, su supplements, more coffee, um, or um, foods, whatever, just to ask yourself, what's happening? Why am I, why is my energy low? Just look for the root. Don't just settle with the symptom. There is a reason why you have low energy. It could be many, many reasons. Uh, it's not always the bad food. It's not always um, 
the you being stressed or whatever it could be like hidden depression it's very like tricky to figure it out but anyway some these are most common symptoms and sometimes could be just one symptom um just like um food sensitivities they not they don't always show themselves as like um digestive issues often they show as um fibromyalgia or joint pain uh, brain fog and it's like ah because you're like i'm fine when i eat tomatoes like i love tomatoes i eat them all the time they never cause any digestive issues but i have brain fog because you have tendency you have sensitivity to tomatoes so that's another thing all the sensitivities that we develop um okay let's see all right to sum up um so low energy can be caused by many factors, and it's very important to investigate and look why we're having the low energy. Um, oops, sorry, guys. Let me just move this. Oh, no. What did I do? Go back. I don't know how to remove this. Okay. Um, so foods that, in theory, can increase our energy that might not be enough because still eat a lot of like energetic foods that increase our energy a lot of those antioxidants a lot of vegetables and good meat and congees and soups and still have low energy uh we do need to investigate closely and observe, observe our bodies and look for answers before concluding why our, our energy is low um our bodies speak to us all the time we are created to um uh, our bodies are created in a way to speak to us and show us just like you feel pain for a reason because if you don't feel pain you might have a wound on your on the bottom of your feet and you never feel it and then it's going to get infected and then you're going to get uh, your food amputated for example the everything that we experience there is a reason for that our bodies are telling us something our cravings in chinese medicine Sweet cravings tend to show spleen deficiency because that's the taste of the spleen. Uh, salty cravings, like salty crunch chips, for example, it's um, it's kidney deficiency or something going on with the kidney, which we see that in Western medicine too. We see that with adrenal fatigue. People have those like salty cravings. I used to have that when I was in school because long hours, a lot of studying. I used to like, put salt in my uh, uh, hand and just lick it. Like mm -hmm. I feel like a goat, but I would just like lick it and it was the most delicious thing to me. Mm -hmm. And I was so tired and my adrenals were completely exhausted and I would do that. Um, bitter taste, uh, that means a lot of heat in the body. Um, sour taste, uh, sour cravings. Um, so all these things can show us something is happening. Your body cell or something is off. That doesn't mean go and eat like a whole cake because you crave it. It just shows you like, I'm a little bit more tired. I need to give myself a break. Those cravings are there for a reason. From Western perspective, we see candida. Like a lot of people with leaky gut or people having candida will have those cravings. Uh, the candida will just want more and more sugar. Um, and it's another thing that we're very addicted to. And we go through withdrawals with sugar too. Mm -hmm. um, so emotions, like feeling certain type of way can tell us something is going on in our body. Like instead of like completely ignoring our emotions or putting a smiley face and being like, oh, everything is fine, whatever. Sit with your emotion, like figure out what's going on um, and address that. Because the more you feel that emotion and you don't pay attention to it, the more damage is going to, to your body, which eventually will show in a physical form. It will. There is no way it won't. A lot of people... Um, they have uh, immune diseases or more terminal diseases I tend to say like I was so stressed the last year I just had so much stress this happened and that happened and then I went and I was diagnosed with this and I'm suffering with that so it's a lot of those emotions that we can't process we live in a society where we're not allowed to show our emotions because we get embarrassed or people will judge us when someone says how are you we automatically say oh good everything is fine when we just want to cry inside um, so it's important to figure out what's happening, to look for help and get therapy, talk with friends. Um, I'm a believer. I go to church, go to church, um, go to a natural medicine doctor, go to your medical doctor, do something to address those things. And, uh, because the better you feel, the more your parasympathetic nervous system will be on and the more your body will take care of itself. And it's all about just balancing your body. And that's how natural medicine usually works. It just helps your body balance itself. Um, aches and pains can show you the, also like sensitivities, lots of inflammation. Why are you having so much inflammation? Why all of a sudden you have all this pain? It's not normal that people have pain. Like it is there for a reason. People say, oh, I'm just old. I have pain. No, there is a reason you have the pain. Uh, it could be a lot of inflammation. It could be bad diet. It could be sensitivities to good foods, to healthy foods, but you have the sensitivities. It could be emotions, something creating this inflammation. 
Um, so figuring that out, uh, trouble digestion, um, that's a big one. Most people have like trouble digestion. Why is it, what, what's happening? Like, is it the food that you eat? Is it the emotion that you have? What is happening? We need to address that because the more we don't look at it, the more, the worse it gets until we get to the point where we just have to go to the doctor and then we're frustrated and we don't, we don't want to deal with it. And the longer it takes with the healing process, unfortunately, mm -hmm. the longer, even like Chinese medicine, it's actually preventative medicine. It's something to prevent diseases to happen, uh, happening, not to go and get it as a last resort. Oh, I've tried everything. I'm here. And this is just the last thing I'll do. And I'll just give it one try. And I'm like, well, it's not going to work. I wish it could work that way, but it just doesn't work. It's preventive medicine. It can help with treating things, but it will take longer and you have to be committed. But I get it. People get frustrated. They spend money and it's like, they don't want to deal with it. So to, to prevent that, listen to your body. Your body will talk to you and will tell you things that are happening. Certain cravings that you have. I, when I was a vegan, I remember I never liked burgers. Never. Even before I was a vegan. I became a vegan. After a couple of months, I, I was thinking about burgers all the time. Just mm -hmm. the meat and everything. I was like, I don't even like that. Why? And I was like, you know, I'll just order one. I worked at a restaurant up in Baltimore at the time, order a burger. I like my whole mouth filled with so much saliva. I never felt that way. It was like, I was an animal. Like it was like <laughs> dripping off my mouth. I was like, this is so embarrassing. What's happening? I ate that burger, like nothing else, like three bites. Like I barely chew it. I just swallow it. Like my dog used to just get so excited and just like chew it twice. And I'm like, you don't even know what you ate. So that's literally what I did. So my body was telling, was craving something that realized that it had a lot of iron and B vitamins. Um, and I needed that because I was so depleted, tired all the time, depressed, and I couldn't figure out why. But anyway, your bodies will talk to you. Um, pay attention and you'll find the answer. Very important. I will not find the answer for you. Nobody else will. Google won't find it. It will give you all these answers, all these things. Mm -hmm. You're going to get overwhelmed. You will not want to do anything. Just listen to your body. Stay with your body and just see the things journal i tell a lot of my patients to journal like food journaling is a big thing and writing at the end of the day what they ate and also how they felt throughout the day emotionally i was really irritable today and my stomach kind of hurt i was kind of gassy i went to the bathroom and my poop smelled kind of bad and i, I had loose tools or whatever it is so and you see throughout the weeks that there there is a correlation between some of the foods that you eat and the way you feel and some of the things could be very healthy. It could be blueberries. I have sensitivities to blueberries, which is super odd because it's an antioxidant, the mm -hmm. best one. But we create things like that. Our bodies do. So you can react to pecans and walnuts, which are so good for your brain. Um, but you don't know apples. So by seeing certain things, you can be like, wait a minute, every time I eat this or I combine these foods uh, like high fat or high sugar or whatever, I just feel kind of like blah and just I shouldn't eat that anymore. But we don't think like that because we tend to forget. Like, I don't remember what I ate this morning. I don't. Like, I seriously don't. It's like, maybe if I think about it, I'll remember. But anyway, um, if we don't write it down, we won't remember, especially weeks prior. You just don't. And sometimes you see how much you eat or how less you eat. And then you're like, wow, I barely eat. I should eat better. But having things on paper is just easier. You can type it on the computer. It's easier, whatever. But that's a big thing um, that you can do um, to help yourself and kind of find the answers for yourself because there's so much information online about supplements and foods and what to eat, what not to eat. Chinese medicine says, eat uh, cooked foods. It's bad. Like you go to a Chinese restaurant, you never see like a bunch of salads and smoothies there. They Everything is cooked. The thing that they want it cooked will be the sushi, which they don't eat that much in China, by the way. And they have ginger, which is very hot in nature and kills parasites and so on. But they have things to counteract. So cold food with a hot food. Um, most of the things are cooked in China. Not most. or well, everything is cooked, really. They have the seaweed salad. That is the salad that they have. Um, they just don't do not do that. But at the same time, I was telling you earlier, oh, all these antioxidants, all these fruits and vegetables. So which one should you do? It's all about your digestion. Where is your body? Do you have a lot of heat? Do you have a lot of cold in your body? Because those will be your cravings. People with lots of heat will tend to want a lot of salads, a lot of cold foods, which can eventually damage their spleen. Uh, people that easily get constipated might eat cooked foods and be like, I'm super constipated. I can't eat that. I need salad. So we can see the, the digestion, the inflammation in your body um, to figure out why you're feeling the way you do and where that is coming from. Um, so it's all subjective. That's why I love Chinese medicine so much because it's really for the person and it's not like, oh, this diet is for you or these herbs are for you. You have the same symptoms as her, so I'm going to put you on the same diet or on the same herbs. No, 
it's very very different uh and that's how you should look at yourself if someone tells like i tried this and help me for that does that that doesn't mean it will help you because your symptoms might be different and your we call it energetics might be very different so you might have the same symptom with someone else but the root of the issue it's very different so that needs to be investigated and again one thing is journaling just kind of observing your body the things that you do emotions and kind of addressing all that and i know it could be overwhelming because it's just so much and you're already so busy you have jobs and families and oh, i can't even do that now but just start slow it's best for you best for your psyche to start everything so just one step at a time like incorporate one thing this week like start eating a little bit more fatty fish this week then next week do something else or and just start adding things and eventually this will become your lifestyle and it's much better than trying to change your whole life tomorrow you're not going to do it you're going to it's going to be overwhelming and you're going to collapse and you'll be like oh, i'm going to go back to the stress and bad diet for example so just one step at a time be patient with yourself with your bodies um and you'll see the change you'll see more energy um you feel better emotionally physically and um, things little by little will balance itself. Your body, your own body will balance itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it. How often would you yeah. eat the fatty fish? Um, it depends. I mean, two, three times a week. It depends if you're taking omega-3. I mean, it's never bad to eat, especially if it's a good wild caught fish. Will um, it still have the lead in it? Large fish? Have mercury? Yeah, uh, mercury. Yeah. Uh yeah, I know. That's the other thing. And that's why when you buy omega-3, you should look for small fish one. Yeah. So that's very important. Yeah, and that's the thing, it's kind of hard with the sea because there's so much pollution in the sea. So it's like, oh, what should I really eat? Even if it's wild caught, where was it caught? <laughs> what mm -hmm. did it have in the water? So that's a hard one. Uh that's why you know doing different detoxes, taking different supplements can help and our bodies are also equipped to fight lots of those things um they get compromised by us being stressed and eating bad a lot mm -hmm. so that's a big thing you believe you have to also believe your body and know that you and you fight it all the time like bacteria parasites viruses even if you like wash your hands all the time and do all these things they're mm -hmm. still all over the place and uh you have to just believe that your body will fight it off especially if you if you give your body the rest that it needs and of sleep um all the proper things and a lot of us know we just don't do it we're like oh i don't have time for myself i have to take care of my child or my husband or whatever it's yeah so that that's a big thing um and just mm -hmm. yeah what is your name uh my name is martina gustova oh, i should have brought my oh, i think i have business cards you yes k-o-s-t-o-v-a i have some business cards and i'll give you guys uh you can send me emails ask me any questions um if you look at supplements o-v-a -E yes also i heard at like a cancer center our dietitian talking about mm -hmm. that um you can eat all the antioxidants you want but as mm -hmm. far as taking supplements mm -hmm. it's not good because the cancer cell can mm -hmm. also um do better with those <laughs> Thank you. so what is it the... that um that as far as um you can eat all the antioxidant foods, right. you know, but as far as taking supplements, mm -hmm. you shouldn't because mm -hmm. it will make the cancer yeah. cell right. Right. The off and so. so that's also kind of controversial, and I'll tell you why. So research shows kind of it's, it's really not conclusive too. So sometimes it shows, and again, guys, there's that's the my email. You can uh, send me an email, ask me any questions, and so on. Or if, if you're buying supplements <laughs> and you're not sure which ones, whatever. Um, thank you. But um, so yes, even even in Chinese medicine, that was like the traditional Chinese old medicine saying like we should not give tonifying herbs like ginseng. It's very tonifying to uh, can, to patients that have cancer because that will tonify also the the cancer. It will grow. It's gonna get worse. Um, research there's a research that also shows that tonifying herbs tend to be actually really good for the body because it boosts your immune system that's why a lot of the cancer patients now are getting the immunotherapy mm -hmm. um, that has become a, a big big one and it has very high success more than chemotherapy and radiation in fact um, and that is like boosting your immune system so your immune system can fight with it um, there is a doctor in um, Sarasota I actually interned with a doctor that was one of his students he's very famous dr Zhao, and he did he worked for moffitt the cancer mm -hmm. hospital and he did a research with them with um chinese herbs and uh 
taken while the people were on chemotherapy and all of the herbs were very tonifying. So I was very confused by that. And he had very high success. And he did a whole research on that with Moffitt, showing that these herbs are safe taken with patients that are on chemotherapy and they're very opposite. The chemotherapy kills everything and the mm -hmm. herbs tonify. So he had very high success. The doctor I interned with uh, was his student and he used his herbs all the time. And it was two major formulas and he gave it to all of his patients, uh, all his cancer patients. And he had a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but I, you know, I agree with that to a certain extent because that has been taught in schools a lot, um, even with certain points on the body that we use with acupuncture. They say, don't use like this and that point because they're very tonifying and it's, you're going to tonify the cancer. Mm -hmm. But now I see that those same doctors use those points all the time because they want to tonify the immune system to fight the cancer. Otherwise, cancer, even if it's very weak, eventually will take over. So, yes. What is your opinion of flat organic flaxseed oil? That's a good choice for vegans. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually really good also for women that have PMS, premenstrual syndrome, uh, because of the progesterone. It tends to like boost our progesterone. And um, it's a good choice, but it's not complete. Just like protein yeah. is not always the same. And Dr. Lindy always says that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. But um, with the, the, the fish mm -hmm. oils, now they do, they put chemical mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And a lot of supplements will say like heavy metal tested, pesticide taste tested, no hormones, this and that. So that's obviously, and they're more expensive. Right. And that will be, but again, like you never know, like, was it a third party tested? Like, who says that? Because they can buy whatever they want in the United States. Because, well, so, <laughs> yeah, so they're not, we're not very regulated here. So that's, sorry. Yeah. You have a question online. Um, I know some acupuncturists are not in favor of enemas, but could you speak mm -hmm. to what your view in Chinese medicine's view are of doing major mm -hmm. detoxes and how that affects the spleen chi and other organ balances, imbalances after doing a month of Pancha Karma? Do you have an opinion on that? Okay. Yes. So in Chinese medicine, that was never a thing. Like the Chinese never thought that that's a way to detox or to do anything. Um, animals are also very controversial too. I've heard very mixed opinions about it. Um, so the coffee animal, which was a big one and it still is, it's quite addictive. It's actually good for liver cancer. Um, it detoxifies the liver. It actually drops the blood sugar. And I had a patient that she's she has diabetes and she lives in uh, Virginia and she said every time she has very high blood sugar she will give herself coffee and mind her bl blood sugar will drop right away and she'll feel much better and so on but also there's like a lot of things going on in the large intestine we make vitamin k in it uh, we ferment uh, fiber in it um, there's lots of bacteria lots of things going on that we don't necessarily want to wash this out uh, just like back in the day with um vaginal douches that was a big thing now we know it's not good because the vagina it's a self-cleaning organ so we don't want to disturb the microbiome there um and now we don't do it anymore but back in the day gynecologists used to recommend it all the time and it was normal for women to do it so enema has been going on for quite some time and people have done it and uh it especially the coffee enema tends to be very addictive people will like literally get addicted to it want to do it all the time you can have obviously negative effects and also positive effects um i don't have much experience with it because again i've heard and i've seen different research and kind of controversial even places that they do the animals professionally the um, i forgot what they're called like uh, colonics. colonics yes um i had a friend that she used to own one she doesn't anymore she said that she actually realized how much damage that was doing so she closed it and moved back to bulgaria but she at the time she was doing it here and it was very successful and eventually just show a lot of things were going on and she said that is she concluded it's not good um so everything in moderation i would say again will be okay but not in long term and if you just think about the microbiome and so on we're not really supposed to do that even though people swear by it and say like oh it's so amazing it makes me feel like some here will make you feel great should you take it no Mm -hmm. um so we, we have to look at like long term yeah. and so on and like kind of doing things that are almost unnatural to us and to because our bodies are created certain way like uh you know we're the alkaline diet for example helping with cancer and so on 
uh, but also the acidity in the body. So our stomach and the vagina, they have to be acidic to fight bacteria and so on. So we kind of mess up with the pH in the body. So we have to be careful with that because there is a pH in the large intestine. So I don't see how um, alkaline water survives your stomach. <laughs> yeah, it's actually not good for everyone unless no, they have, I mean, very you have acidic. all that acid. I mean, what's it really going to do? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> I know. What's the, what's the, What's the alkaline really going to, how's it going to last to her? Yeah, there's a lot of things. Yeah, uh, just like a lot of like uh, chelated um, also vitamins that are also big, mm -hmm. uh, they tend to survive. Uh, they tend to actually be better for people with low hydrochloric acid. But uh, the probiotics with prebiotics, the probiotics from sp uh, spores tend to be better because they survive the digestive system. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that won't survive yeah. for a reason. Because again, if yeah. things survive, it, we, we're going to die. Like mm -hmm. we're just not going to survive um so yeah there's a lot of controversy around all these ideas i would usually wait like some time for things to be really proven we can try them and just again listen to your body your body will tell you just because everyone tells like for example the celery juicing that was so big like i tried it and i like almost pooped myself a couple of times i could not hold it i was at work and i was like this is happening here and i'm gonna take the embarrassment and it's gonna be fine i felt so much energy i i was doing it every single day in the morning first thing in the morning i felt so much energy I, all that but all of a sudden i could not and i've never had that problem before so i was like what is happening starting the chinese uh, program realizing that uh, celery tends to be it's good for dampness it will clear dampness but it's very cold in nature it's going to destroy your stomach and the, the spleen and the stomach work together and spleen holds things in place. So my spleen got destroyed, couldn't hold things in place and things started like falling out. <laughs> so that, yeah, now it's not like the best thing, but people swear by it. And just like changing your diet, like a healthy diet will do, a, will do something good, like the keto diet that tends to be very unhealthy eventually, but it, for a short period of time could be good for someone to lose lots of weight because they have heart disease and so on. So they can go to that extreme. But over a long period of time, it tends to be very unhealthy and actually very bad for the kidneys because of all the protein mm -hmm. that they have to process. Um, and a lot of people who have like um, a gout because it's the breakdown of its uric acid buildup and it's the breakdown of the cell, of the red blood cells. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, I mean, th with all these trends, you have to be very careful. You can try things and see if they work for you because that might work for you, but it might not work for me at all because we're just very different, even mm -hmm. if we have the same symptoms. And just listen to your body. When your body starts acting certain way, when your bowel movement changes for worse, uh, when your appetite changes, when your emotions, this is not good for you. It does not matter what, whoever says whatever, <laughs> it just won't, won't be good. Okay. That's very informative. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. Let's see. Thank you so much for coming, listening to me. These are my, my references. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. My pleasure. I try to look for uh, like PubMed and uh, Mayo Clinic, so more like um, research type of place, not just random articles. Some of them were just for basic information. I had to list it because I put it on. And it's obviously not, I didn't invent it, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you look for things, always look for things that are research, even though even research is very not conclusive and it's very limited. Uh, but certain things are accurate and it's good to look into it mm -hmm. and understand why certain things work certain way. Just like I was trying to explain to you with the mitochondria and our cells and what's really happening in our body on when we talk about energy, because I could have just made it very basic and said like, oh, these foods will give you more energy. Don't eat this because it's bad for you. And it, all of you will be like, okay, we already knew that. I shouldn't eat junk. And, <laughs> but it's like kind of deeper than that. And going mm -hmm. into it, um, it's really interesting and just understanding your body a little deeper. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank, Thank you for coming. Yeah. All right. I exit on. Yes. I have like um you I have a like a year and a half. I mean my hair still hasn't come back sure from that yet, yeah, really. Oh, and, what did um, you call? I'm sorry. I had diarrhea for a year and a half. Yeah. Pain and everything I had a lot of sleep on it. My friend